here. for this one.
Is there no way to do this? Oh, here. Um, we want we want AirPlay and this to be the same. Yes. We're going to have to use my machine. What does your machine do? It has two Thunderbolts. Oh. Yeah, that's fine. You got a keynote, right? Um, I have <laughs> an older version of keynote. How old? And that's not pages. Right. So there's no like Thunderbolt splitter or something like that. Do you want to do that? Do you want to do that? If we take this down, put a line up there, so I don't have to retake that. Okay, there it is. Okay, so this goes away. This goes away. Go away! Okay, so you airplay. Can you unairplay yourself? I know I unairplayed you. You did? Yeah. Uh, I need your presentation. Jack, do you have a thumb drive handy? To be where you are. That's a country bus my song. I need to be where you are. Do you know what time it is? Uh, how old of a you know, uh, version do you have? I don't know. Yeah, is your machine, machine the only machine with two Thunderbolts? No, there are many, but very few people have Keynote. Where's Keynote? Oh, really interesting. Matt, or anyone, are we leaving this open? Or are we closing it for like sound issues or something like that? I think we should probably. Oh, I could update Keynote, couldn't I? Are you sure it's the old version? My words is also keynote on that. How is that it? Maybe have it so I'm going to grab a thumb drive. Thumb drive. Do you have a game? Uh, it's over there. Well, keep pushing it up while this one. Couple one is up. I was going to say, I think, yeah, you can see that. Adapters I pulled one of the thumb drives out of my box. Can I, uh, We're going to use this mic. So we're going to work it
See that uh, this better be good. <laughs> Why, what's up? God is just not showing up first on the
Stream living now, or live streaming? Stream living. So this audience. There's always the first. So I'm going to be a dumb Whoa, careful. Yeah, I had a question. <laughs> <laughs> you, sir, in the uh, maroon pants. <laughs> How'd you get the nickname Slim? <laughs> I got it in college as a user. Yeah, I can get very little off that line. So we're getting very little. I mean, I can hear you. You can hear me, but what's that? Yeah, what mic is that? Yeah. That's that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's it is. I'm going to sit in the back and be like, uh, no one gets to be that in mic. They can be shot. I don't think anyone's going to be shot. Yeah. Well, can we keep up? Well, oh, this is asking questions, we just say, sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> Speak up! Speak up! Hey. Yeah, so I'm asking a question for Slim. How does it sound? You hear it? I mean, it's, it's, as long as it's audible, the problem is I can't do anything. What? What do you mean? I can hear like this. Oh, 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 without the earphones. So determining what I'm hearing here versus what I'm hearing like this. Well, I mean, what I could also do is repeat the question. Hello, how do you do? Maybe a lot around like that. I think it's fine. As long as it's we're good. Yes, I'm start. I'm starting to talk with a lavalier on. Can you hear me now? I'm on Verizon. Whatever. Sibylins. This is what the radio station always used to say. Yes, but, uh, yes, were you asking me something about how this is going to work? I, I am. You want me to stay on that camera? Uh, until we need this camera. Oh, you're right. Right, you want me to stay on that camera until we need that. Yeah. And then once we go to questions, we're going to switch. Yep. So most of the time the slide is showing, right? That's what you said. All the way around. All the way around. Oh. When you change the slide. When I change the slides? Yeah. For how long? I don't know. And how are you going to know when I change my slide? Because we'll see it. Oh, yeah, okay. Because that's what I think to some of the yeah. screen. So try not to be so interesting that I lose track of this. Yeah. What's this? Like what I'm doing here? <laughs> I'll be as boring as I possibly yeah, that would really, that would really, really help. Please disengage the audience. Do you want me to be here? Okay. It's up to you. I Oh, Amy. Oh, exactly. It looks exactly the same. I know. It's like it's as if I've never met. I hope I look exactly the same. You do. Thank you. I'm sure. Hello, sir. Am I going to get a hug from you? Oh, sure. How's the uh, life of a, uh, a, a child bearing parent? Full of not much sleep. Still? Oh, you have another one. There's already three. Well, yeah.
From city to city to city. Other than that, I think I'm just wired, um, not knowing what the hell's going on. Kind of Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Chris Roberts. I'm a designer here at My Design, as well as a board member with AIDA Pittsburgh. And we'd like to welcome you here for another installment of our Soapbox Lecture Series. Um, today, we have um, a special guest that um, is fairly well known here at Maya for his tenure that he spent here, um, Sung Chin Lim, also known as Slim. Um, he's going to be here talking to us today about um, his project into understanding empathy and its role in the design process. Um, just to give you a quick blurb about him, um, Slim is a computer scientist, manager by training, designer, researcher, engineer by trade, and performer and speaker by birth. He is the author of the award-winning book, Realizing Empathy, An Inquiry into the Meaning of Making, which he draws a parallel between the creative process with that of having an empathic, empathic sorry, conversation with another person. Um, and after this, uh, just a quick note too, Sun has some books with him too. If you're interested in purchasing one, I'd also be glad to uh, give his John Hancock to too if you're uh, interested in that as well. So, a uh, well, short QA after this as well. So, um, without further ado, Slim. All designers do is make stuff look pretty. That's what I told my computer science advisor back in college. I was 21 and very arrogant. But after that, I worked for nine years here at Maya Design. And what I quickly learned was how prejudiced I was. There's a pattern in my life. And the pattern is, whenever I'm confronted with something that I do not fully understand, something that makes me feel uncomfortable, I have this intense desire to judge it, usually in a negative way, just like I did with design. But even after I learn a lesson, I keep doing this over and over and over again. Because after I learned my lesson with design, I then picked another discipline to put down. This time, art. I thought, design, good, useful, noble, art. I don't know about that. It just seems very useless, kind of bs -y, you know. But then I spent the next four years studying both visual and performing arts. And once again, I realized how prejudiced I was. But thankfully, that's not all I learned. I also learned that at the heart of what we call the creative process is realizing empathy. And that's what I want to talk about. Now, let me ask you a quick question. Is empathy is a word that's often talked about. Anybody hazard a guess as to why empathy is important? Anybody? Yes? Wow, OK. Any other reasons? Well, it's not an, that's not what I expected. <laughs> Mostly people say, well, it's about being nice to other people, or it's about being polite or kind. But today, I want to challenge that a little bit and say, think about, uh, think about empathy in the context of empowerment, and also about what's in it for the person who's practicing. Is it really about simply being altruistic? Is there more to it than that? And also think about the idea of empowerment in situations like, if you do not feel empowered to help others, if you do not have, feel empowered to fulfill the needs of the users, or if you do not feel empowered to have a constructive, productive interaction with other people, maybe there's an issue of empathy in that relationship. Now, let me tell you a story. About 10 years ago, I had a close friend who was suffering from bipolar depression. Does anybody not know what a bipolar depression is? Okay. 
So at the time, it was about three years out of college. So I was still very much in my computer science mode. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to solve her problem. I went online and read everything there was about depression. Uh, I even read articles, magazines, you name it. I read it all. And then I went to a psychiatrist to get advice on what I could do. And what the psychiatrist told me was, if you want to help your friend, the best thing you can do is to try and empathize with her. And I said, OK, how do you do that? And she said, oh, here's what you do. Next time she gets depressed, sit down with her and listen to her very closely. And if you think you understand how she's feeling and why, reflect that back to her. And if that understanding is correct, she'll feel understood, and that will make her feel better. I was like, oh, I can do that. That sounds easy. But then I tried it. And I quickly, re quickly realized how difficult this was. Because the whole time I was trying to understand her, she kept screaming, yelling, and crying. And she kept telling me that I did not understand. So what was, what was I supposed to do? I just kept revising my story over and over and over again, hoping I would eventually get it right. But I couldn't. Maybe half an hour passed by. I was just sitting there with all my energy drained, unable to figure out what it was that I was missing. But then something occurred to me. And I thought, hmm, maybe it's possible that something I had said to her earlier in the day, maybe that had something to do with her feeling the way she's feeling now. So I told her that. And like magic, she stopped yelling, screaming. And she sat there sobbing. Now what I learned at that point was that every story I've been telling her up to that point was framed in such a way that it was all her fault. And I had nothing to do with it. Because she was the problem, and I was the solution. In fact, I started out thinking I knew the answer. I knew the solution. And it was exceedingly simple. She just had to cheer up. If I could logically explain that to her, she would snap out of her depression. That's how I thought. But in hindsight, of course, this was not the case. If anybody had to snap out of it, it was me. And then something even more surprising happened. It's that she thanked me. And I didn't know that I could be thanked for trying to understand someone and reflecting that understanding back. And when that entire ordeal was over, I couldn't understand why I hadn't thought of this simple idea in the first place. Because it was so obvious in hindsight. Now, what if I'd said, now, what if, what if you imagine for a moment what it would have been like for me to go through that experience? Just imagine what the kind of struggles were present in that interaction that made it difficult for me to empathize with my friend. And also, imagine what might have empowered me to be able to eventually empathize with my friend. And now, what if I said, the same kind of struggle exists in what we call the creative process. And the same kind of requirement that helps us realize our empathy with other human beings helps us in our creative process. Now, before I go any further, I have to make sure that I'm communicating clearly. Does anybody have a definition of empathy? Anybody? Yes, back. Putting yourself in someone else's shoes. OK, great. 
that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, so in my research, what I found is that there's a psychologist by, by the name of Daniel Batson who lists eight significantly different ways in which people use the word empathy. What that means is that when I use the word empathy, there's absolutely no guarantee that other people are actually understanding what I mean by empathy. So I want to make clear of what I mean by empathy. Now, one of the questions I asked when I was writing the book was, why is empathy so easily misunderstood? Why is it so complicated? And the answer turned out to be extremely simple. And that's because empathy is an explanatory principle. Now, what is that, an explanatory principle? Well, explanatory principle. So in the beginning of the story, I started off not empathizing with my friend. Or more technically, I was sympathizing with my friend, which is I felt sorry for her, which, drive me, which drove me to want to help her. At the end of the day, I was able to empathize with her. Now what empathy, or, uh, um, and specifically by empathizing, I mean I had an experience where I felt as if I was embodying or, or understanding the experience of my friend, right? a subjective experience. Now what empathy does is it tries to explain how do we go from point A to point B. That's an explanatory principle. Now the issue is, the actual explanation of how we go from here to here is still up for grabs. There are scientists who say, well, there's this thing called uh, our ability to catch other people's emotion, also known as emotional contagion. And they would say, well, that explains how this happens. Then there are other scientists who say, well, there's this thing called the theory of mind, which is what explains how we go from here to here. Then most recently, there's neuroscientists who say, oh, mirror neurons. There's this magical thing that explains how we go from here to here. Well, I mean, there's no conclusive evidence that says any one of those conjectures is correct. I would imagine it's all of the above and possibly even more. But for, this, for the context of this talk, I want to be clear that empathy is, a, is, a, is an answer to the question of how we go from here to there. And the phrase I would like to introduce is realizing empathy. And that is the process of going from A to B. So empathy as the potential, empathizing as the experience, and realizing empathy as the process. Now there are two different ways in which realizing empathy can happen. One is it can happen to us, passively, involuntarily, automatically. Imagine a time where you're watching a movie and you can instantly connect with the character. Or maybe you're in a shower and all of a sudden something your mother told you 20 years ago all of a sudden makes sense. These are instances when your empathy is realized involuntarily. It takes very little effort, if any. But there are also times, and it works like rolling a ball downhill. But there are also another time when you have to realize empathy deliberately and consciously. Think of a time when you're encountering somebody you do not understand, somebody you disagree with, somebody you think is evil. Empathy is not going to automatically realize for you in that situation. And it's more like pushing a ball uphill. Now, can you show a raise of hands if you can remember an instance where you're having trouble realizing empathy? So it's fairly universal. Now, I want you to think about the possibility that whenever that happens, there is some kind of conflict in that interaction. Whether you realize it or not, there's some kind of conflict. And to realize empathy in those situations, you need to be fulfilling three conditions. One, this may be obvious, but you have to be aware that there is a conflict. This might seem very obvious, but we'll soon realize this is very non-obvious. Second is that you actually have to, you want to resolve that conflict. If you don't want to, you don't have to, but it won't work. And finally, you have to have the sensitivity, the knowledge, the skills, 
and perhaps even the peace of mind to be able to do so. But now, what do you think was the conflict between me and my friend in the story? Anybody has a guess as to what the conflict was? Yeah? Righteousness? Like, ooh. You felt like there was a right and wrong. And she, she wasn't really. Yeah. I mean, the basic pattern behind the, the, the kind of conflict we're talking about is a conflict between the way you think what something is, or how reality is, and how reality actually is. It's a very simple idea. But the problem is, that conflict was completely invisible in the beginning. I had no idea that that was the conflict. I thought the conflict was between the amazing solution I had and the unwillingness of the participants to accept my amazing solution. That's what I thought was the conflict. But again, in hindsight, that was not the case. So the conflict is invisible. This makes it very difficult um, for us to fulfill these conditions. Now, while I do not dare say that I embodied or understood my friend 100%, because that invisible conflict was resolved for that specific context, I would say that I empathized enough for that. So how do we fulfill these conditions? Let's try a simple scenario. Um, I'm going to pick on you, Mark. Let's say we're, uh, well, wow, this, this is the first time this is actually true. Like we, let's say we've known each other for a long time. <laughs> um, and, but we had a big fight, a big argument. We never made up. Um, so it's been a really, really long time since we've met. But then we bump into each other in the street. And you probably want to avoid me, and I want to avoid you too. But for some reason, I walk up to you and I say, hi. How would you respond? Yeah, right. Perfectly logical. I would do the same thing. Now, what was the underlying assumption behind what you think, you, what, what you think I meant by hi? No, that's not a trick question. Yeah, sure. It's a, just a greeting. Right? Again, absolutely logical. So this is what we do. When we encounter a signal, we select a possible meaning from a pre-existing selection of possible meaning. And the context helps us narrow this down. Like on the street, this is a guy I used to know, so he probably means hot. And here's an example. Same signal, different meaning. And that's called making an association. This is what we do every day. Now, this works fine until we encounter something unfamiliar and unexpected. Like, for example, after you say hi back, what if I said, no, hi as an up high? How would that make you feel? <laughs> Uncomfortable. Weird, right? Whatever, strange, confused. And is that a positive or a negative feeling? <laughs> sure. A lot of people would say it's negative, and they would call, even call it a problem. And a problem must be solved. And do you know the popular way to minimize that feeling of awkwardness, that uncomfortability? A very popular way, besides just leaving the conversation. Any, any ideas? That's, that, that's an absolutely possible way. Even more popular way is to judge. For example, if you think, like, that guy's a weird. It makes perfect sense for a weird guy to say weird things, right? That it's completely rationalized. And it helps us minimize our pain just a little bit. And that's also what a computer does when you, it raises an exception or you know, throws an error. I don't know what you're talking about. But is there an alternative to that kind of interaction? Is there a different way of reframing the situation away from a problem to something else? Let's think about this. So I say, no, high as an up high, as if from my perspective it makes perfect sense to say such a thing. Yet from your perspective, it makes absolutely no sense. 
from one perspective it makes sense, from another it doesn't. Do you know of another name for this kind of situation? It's called a paradox. Paradox is basically a conflict between reality and what your expectation of what reality should be. The same applies here. But if we reframe something as a paradox, there's a subtle shift in our mental attitude, which is away from, let me fix that, or let me solve this problem, to, I'm missing something. Maybe very subtle, but very, very important distinction. And this can, be feel, this can feel very uncomfortable, because we don't know what we're missing. And we feel this feeling called dissonance. We're holding two conflicting viewpoints, emotions, these things at the same time. But as uncomfortable as this may be, this is the first step, step toward reframing the situation to something we can work on. Now, once you're able to reframe the situation as a paradox, the next step is to, to, to try and figure out how to resolve the paradox. Any idea how you would do this? Sure. Yeah. Very simple, right? Instead of judging me as weird, you could say, that's interesting, Slim. Why did you say high as an up high? Very unlikely, but possible. And maybe I'll pause for a second and maybe fidget and then say, I'm sorry, Mark. It, it's just been so long since I last saw you. I felt really awkward. I just thought I'd maybe make you laugh, some stupid joke. That was all I could think of at that moment. I'm sorry. I, what I really wanted to do was maybe apologize for that thing. Now, can you, based on that information, have a better idea of how I was feeling. Well, what, what I needed. And as simple as that may sound, that's an insight. And did this insight resolve the paradox for that context? If it did, then for that particular context, you've empathized enough. But now, Here's the interesting part. How did the paradox get resolved? There's a journalist by the name of Arthur Kostler who wrote a book called The Act of Creation. And in that book, he famously defined creativity as this, a collision, a fusion, or a confrontation of two independent matrices of perception or reason. Fusing things that don't look like it might connect but in hindsight, it does. And what bisociations do is it changes your understanding of the context so you can make new meaning. And that's exactly what happened in that particular interaction. That when you go through this process, you cannot help but experience bisociation. Now, what else did I do in the story of me and my friend? I was also trying to reflect back my understanding to my friend. The same pattern here. In the beginning, all I was doing was making the most obvious associations. You know, telling is probably this, it's that. But then through conversation, I was revising my story over and over and over again until I achieved some kind of consonance and then I was able to have a new choice of action, a new story that I told her that resonated with her. And not only resonated with her, but also myself. It was mutually meaningful. Now, based on our short exchange, can you say something now to me or make an offer to me that you think would be meaningful to both of us? We should talk about that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Or let's go grab coffee or something. Again, very simple. You know what this is? That's innovation. Innovation is not making some wildly crazy new thing. 
It's making something new, but also meaningful and valuable enough to the context in which it is being introduced to, such that those, ex those influence experience both surprise and gratitude. Like in that context, I'm grateful that you're willing to have that conversation and grab coffee. And it was also a surprise because it's not something I expected to hear from you. And if this really originated from your realizing empathy, you were not doing this for me, but it was simply an honest expression. It was sincere. Right? It was something you genuinely wanted to do. And the choice might have been new, but it feels inevitable. It feels like that was the only possible choice you could have made at that moment. And that's what ultimately happens when a paradox gets resolved, is that you're able to be more honest with yourself. It's not so much that you're trying to be creative or trying to be innovative, but that in that process, creativity and innovation emerged as byproducts. And when this happens, the relationship between us goes through a kind of a change. Our past is still there, but there's something new about this relationship that has gone through a change. And that's the creative process, in a nutshell, juxtaposed to the process of realizing empathy. Now let's get deeper. I prefer to call that process as engaging another in an empathic conversation. And the reason is, in real life, it's not so linear. Uh, there's all these things happening at the same time in parallel, and usually in a loop between self and other. And the way I see it, there are four processes that are intertwined and intersecting. And also because when you, con when you think about it as a conversation, it also works. In everyday conversation, the same exact kind of things occur. So it's nice to have that parallel. So let's look at these one by one. Now, respecting is a word I borrowed from craft, not from some other discipline, but specifically from craft. And in the craft discipline, they talk, they say, respect materiality. And at the beginning, I was like, what does that mean, respect materiality? Like, you bow down to the material or something? That's the way I used to think. But then I had a chance to work with glass. Has, has anybody worked with glass before? Oh, wow, OK. That's a lot. It's fantastic. So that's one of the materials I got to work with. And it was probably the most difficult, different, and unpredictable material I've ever worked with. So just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like, what it, what it works like, so when you take the glass molten out of the furnace, it behaves like jelly. Just, she just keeps on stretching. And one of the projects I did, I took a list of verbs, say to fold, to cut, whatever it is. I listed, uh, took a list of them, and one by one, I tried to enact them on glass. And one of the verbs was to tear. Now, can you imagine tearing a piece of molten glass? It was difficult. But my friend and I, went through hoops, and eventually got this. And I was extremely proud. I was like, hell yeah, I tore glass. So I took it and went to the critic, and I said, proudly, amazing piece of artwork. I tore glass. And the critic kind of looked at me funny and said, hmm, that's interesting. But I think, Slim, I think what you really did was you made glass look torn as if it were a piece of paper. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. That never occurred to me. And in hindsight, that's precisely what I did. The moment I heard the word to tear, I had a specific form in mind that I was unwilling to let go. 
And the whole time, all I was trying to do is make something look a specific way. I had absolutely no desire to learn anything about glass. Okay? I was unwilling to accept it for what it is, unwilling to respect it. And this is not that this is the wrong way to do it, but that it's one way to do it. Okay? There could have been, I don't know, thousands of different ways of tearing glass that I never really bothered to explore. And that's not all. When I said glass was difficult, different, and unpredictable, it's because I was comparing it to some other material that I found more easier to work with. A master glass blower might not say that it's different, difficult, or unpredictable. They have a degree of mastery that empowers them to interact with it in a different way. And that's what it means to respect. Because oftentimes we confuse or we think respecting means to tolerate or to accommodate. But neither of those stances help flow conversations. Nor does it help us get out of creative processes where we're stuck. And think of how many times conversations get derailed, gets derailed because you're blocked, because people are labeling each other, blaming each other. Think of conversations where you're blaming yourself. This happens a lot with users, right? They're using the computer and they're blaming themselves for being an idiot. Anytime there's that kind of block, there's something like this going on. So when trying to realize empathy, respecting is to accept the fact when the other seems different. It's not so much because they're different, although they are, but more because you expect them to be the same means to trust that there exists another angle from which to look at the other when the other will no longer seem so weird. It's willing to suspend judgment. Now, second one, listening. Listening is a word I also I, I learned from that psychiatrist I met, but I also heard it many many times in uh, in furniture design, and that's where I sort of borrow the word from. Now, this was a wood shop that I that I used to work at, and this was a gigantic wood shop, maybe like three times the size. And one day I was just making some furniture because it was a project I was um, supposed to do, and I was using a Japanese handsaw at the time. And this is a, kind of a tradition at, at a lot of art schools. You use hand tools before you graduate to machine tools. So I was using that Japanese handsaw. And in case you're curious, this is what it sounds like. Not bad. Am I getting sound? No? Yes, maybe? No sound? OK, let me poke. So see if you can hear this. So that's what it sounded like. So I was just sawing away. And all of a sudden, the carpenter or the tech of the shop, standing maybe 50 feet away over there, starts yelling at me. He's like, you over there, stop doing that. Stop doing what? The sawing. You're doing it wrong. Like, what am I doing wrong? But, well, you're doing it wrong because you're doing it wrong. But how do you know? You're like 50 feet away. And he kind of like chuckles and he starts walking over. And when he gets near, he says, watch this. He says, he unclamps the wood I've been clamping, lowers it down, reclamps it, and says, do it again. And I do it again. And this is how it sounded. The problem was that I clamped the wood too high. So every time I was sawing, it would wobble a bit. It was making that rumbling noise. I swear to God, I heard that sound. But I wasn't listening. 
Now, so what's the difference? Here's another way to think about it. A child psychologist that I interviewed for the book said something very interesting about how babies learn. And he said, in, let's say in the beginning, the baby's world is defined by the touch, the sensations, the smell of mother, let's say. But there will be a day that that baby will hear a footstep, for example, and they will be expecting mother to show up any moment. Right? So the footstep sounds, and you're expecting mother to show up. And there will be a day that somebody else will show up. And that baby will be like, wow, who's that? You know, mother is supposed to show up, but somebody else did. Now at that moment, the baby has the opportunity to reflect and say, huh, interesting. Are there two different footsteps? If you listen more closely, the signal I thought I knew the meaning of has multiple meanings. And do you know what this process is called in developmental psychology? It's known as maturation. This is a simple pattern underlying maturation. So for example, have you, had, uh, have you had the experience where you read, this, read one book when you're 10 years old, read it again when you're 20, it's a different meaning. Read it again when you're 30, different meaning. Right? Did the book change? No. You changed. You went through maturation. Right? So as we mature, the same exact thing supposedly takes on new meanings that we didn't know was there. And that's what it means to listen. Most people think listening is about passively hearing signals or sounds. But no, it's, it's actively inquiring. It's, it's being fully present, paying attention, and inquiring, whether it's through your senses, whether it's through verbal means, but that attitude of active inquiry is always there. But most of the time we're listening not because of that, but we listen because we want to collect information so we can defend ourselves. Or we can listen so we can t it's our turn to speak next. Right? A lot of times conversations can get blocked because of that. But unless we learn something new in that conversation, a conversation that's stuck, nothing's probably going to change. So those two cover the first half of the empathic conversation. And the basic idea is you're letting others impress you, as opposed to you trying to impress others. The second half is the expression. So the word consider I borrowed from graphic design. And this is a word we use a lot. So a few years ago, I was making a poster. It's about 20 by 30 inches. And it was a fairly large poster because we had to cram about 70 different informations into the poster. And the instructor had a very specific mandate. And that was, put the information there, but make sure, or, or not make sure, but, but try to see if you can have the audience have an aesthetic experience. And I'm like, what the hell is an aesthetic experience? Do you mean make it pretty? He's like, no, 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 an aesthetic experience. I go, okay, how do you do that? He's like, well, so the, the core thing you have to learn to do that is to learn to push things to the foreground and pull things into the background. I'm like, oh, that's all? That's it? Oh, I can do that. No. But then I spent the next two months trying poster after poster after poster, just sucking it. Not organized. I don't know what aesthetic experience is. It just looked like crap for two months. But then one day, I stumbled upon this photograph. And as I was staring into the photograph, I felt something. And all of a sudden, it, it occurred to me that maybe what the instructor was trying to say, it's not so much what's in the front or what's in the back, but maybe he's saying that even when somebody's staring at a flat piece of paper, they can feel as if there is an infinite space. Right? And this was non-obvious to me. 
But then ha after having this concrete experience, what he said changed its meaning. And then after about four hours, after two months of sucking, after four hours, I made a whole new poster that looked like this. Now, I'm not saying that this is the world's most amazing poster. All I'm saying is something completely changed in the way I designed a poster because I had a concrete experience as a reference point. Where what the words coming out from the instructor meant something very, very concrete. So words don't have meaning in them. We are making meaning from the words based on our experience. So even if we are using the same words, the instructor and I were completely talking past each other because they meant very different things. But once I had that experience of staring into that picture, we had a, a shared experience that was similar enough. And once we had that shared experience, the words became a metaphor. So we were no longer just exchanging words. We were exchanging concrete meaning. And that's what you're trying to do when you're trying to consider what to express. It's not so much that you're trying to tell other people what to do, or to teach them, or to pass or send messages. You're trying to consider a metaphor. And not and by metaphor, I don't mean some poetic device you put in a, a piece of poem, but having the ability to facilitate an experience that can be shared. Despite the differences, their experience, my experience, finding a way to make that connection through some kind of expression. But in our most conversations, how many times do we actually consider like a poet, like you know, choosing those very careful words, wanting to really share that concrete experience with the other person. Most of the time, we're so busy saying, like, what should I say, or I want to preach to the other person, or unilaterally communicate. Or teachers who have exactly one way of explaining, no other way of explaining to different people with different experience. Much more common to encounter those situations. But one, met, one, one way of expressing cannot be a metaphor for everybody. So in the context of realizing empathy, the focus shifts away from unilateral communication to creating a metaphor, to finding a way to trigger that shared experience, even though it may be different, but making that connection such that we can share something. Final word, acting. Blatantly ripped off from theater. So one day I was in my acting class, and two of my friends were on stage rehearsing for this play called The Streetcar Named Desire. Does everybody know A Streetcar Named Desire? Some people, OK. So there's two, char two main characters, very delicate female character, Blanche, very aggressive, hyper-masculine, butch character named Stanley. And it was a scene where Stanley was accusing Blanche of lying. Very aggressive scenes. He's going through her stuff, throwing things around. And I had seen the scene the night before where Marlon Brando plays Stanley and Vivian Lee plays Blanche. So I kind of knew what to expect. And I was judging my friends as I was watching them rehearse. And they weren't doing a good job. At least I didn't. And I think the director agreed, because the director said, stop. That's good, but I think we can do better. Just director speak for, that sucked. <laughs> uh, so, so I was kind of waiting for the director to point them in the right direction. And the director started asking very interesting questions. She said, Blanche, how do you, uh, uh, how do you think Blanche is feeling? Is there a word for it? My friend goes, uh, uh, defensive? The director goes, huh, interesting. What else? My friend goes, uh, vulnerable? The director goes, like, huh, interesting. And then she says, 
have you been in front of another man that made you feel vulnerable and defensive? My friend pauses for a second. And she says, yes. And then the director starts asking very specific questions. How tall was this guy? What was the color of his skin? Was the day cold? Hot? You don't have to say it out loud. Just remember what it was like. And before you know it, my friend begins to weep. And director says, take that with you. And just say the lines. You've memorized it, so you can do it. And as difficult as this must have been for my friend, she does it. And what came out was a brilliant performance. Now at that moment, what I realized was all my life I thought acting was pretending to be someone you're not. But what I witnessed, no, that's not the case. Acting is telling the story of who you are. But the character's names, the situations, the script, the costume, the stage, they're merely a thin frame around the actor's deeply personal and nuanced experiences. And this is how they make their performance their own. And when we witness this, the really good ones, we can't help but feel a sense of resonance. Because it empowers us to feel dignity. That despite all our differences, there's something at the core that we share. That we're not alone. But think of how many times when we express, we're just trying to impress other people, trying to be polite trying to be cool or snazzy. And that actually sometimes they feel like they're being sold to or they, f they don't like you anymore because you're doing that. There's a lot of pressure to, to perform in a, in a pretentious way. But the fact of the matter is, what I've experienced is that the chances are far greater that the other person will resonate if you're willing to be sincerely honest. Now, there's one last story I want to tell you before um, I finish up. And that is, the friend that I just talked about came back to the final project and, did, and, and sang a song. And the song was about the man she remembered on stage to play Blanche. So there she was, standing in front of 20 or so of her own peers, telling the intimate story of who this man was, what her relationship to this man was, and how she was emotionally and physically wounded in that relationship. We were surprised. But think about what empowered her to be able to tell her own story. It was none other than her experience empathizing with the character Blanche. Now, can you remember an instance in your own life where you trying to empathize with somebody else actually helped you better understand or empathize with yourself? Think of a time when you're trying to write really clear for, clearly for other people, and it actually helps you better understand what the hell you're trying to say. Or think of a time that you're trying to teach somebody and that process helped you better learn your own material. Everything you do to realize empathy with another eventually turns around and helps you better empathize with yourself. This is a loop that cannot be cut unless it loses its meaning. The dignity experience is intrinsically reciprocal. And not in the sense of exchanging gifts or favors, but in the sense that the act of giving is in and of itself an act of receiving. 
And this happens in all aspects of our lives, both professional and personal. Whether it's in your interaction with your client, your users, your colleagues, throughout the entire design process, there's always a self and other in conversation. And whether that conversation flows and is creative and constructive versus where it gets blocked and everybody's blaming each other. And as a designer, if you want your users to be creative in their own right, this is what you're trying to facilitate, to make it easier for them to do this or to make it even possible that you can go through this process. And on a personal level, to me, this is the ethics of design. And by ethics, I don't mean morality. I don't, I don't want to tell other people how they should lead their lives or you know, how you should design. But simply the personal choice, the choice you deliberately make in how you design. And being aware that there is something like this underlying the process and that you have the power to change things if you see fit. And I'll be honest, this is not easy by any means. It requires a great deal of humility and courage. But I think, or I hope, that this is something, all the values we talked about, learning new things, being able to um, have creativity, innovation, insight, these things emerge of the process, hopefully, is enticing enough for you to try Thank you. What's next? Mm -hmm. Questions? Can I take questions? Or? Questions, suggestions, vehement disagreements, challenges, yeah. uproarings. Anybody? Yes. Um, I really like the creative connection between um, the social process of empathy and the process of making something. Um, I do have a gap in my mind. Sure. I was wondering if you could help out. Yeah. Um, so the first two of the four uh, processes that you talked about, um, it sort of fit really well with the creative process. Like what kinds of materials am I working with? What problem am I trying to solve? But considering and acting, um, they fit really well with creative expression. Sure. Um, and I'm struggling to make a connection to engineering. Or um, okay, is there a specific, specific thing in mind? In um, not not particularly. I want to think about like um, where situations where um, expression seems less um, of a factor than functionality. So sure. achieving um, a way to um, fulfill certain design requirements and having work in the real world. Um, yes. Sure. And I think it's a it's a matter of a little bit of semantics. Like when when I say express. I don't necessarily mean express, kind of express. Right? So what you make, what you produce, the product that comes out is a form of expression. So what, if that um, embodies the kind of consideration that I'm talking about, like is it meaningful to both you and the other person? Can that connection be made through this product? That's the kind of consideration you're putting into. The layer of acting is, are you doing it sincerely? Um, and if it's sincere, it has a far greater chance of that resonating with other people because there's probably something that you share, kind of a problem or, or, or pain or whatever it is. Um, so making that connection in some kind of form is really the expression that I'm talking about. Does that help a little bit? Any other question? Yes? In your research, <clears throat> did you um, look into any religions, and whether it's Buddhism or Christianity or anything like that? So this is very interesting. I, got, I get that question a lot. I want to understand why. Um, so as I'm supposed to be Asian, but I don't know much about, <laughs> I don't know much about my, um, some, some of the more deeper uh, Eastern philosophies. But that's something a lot of people have come up to me and said, like it, it has remnants of these things from other um, teachings. So that's something I'm, I'm currently exploring, more less so in the context of the research itself. Because I was purely coming from an art and craft kind of perspective. Any other? I thought I saw a hand. Yes. You work with a lot of traumatized communities in different settings from a design standpoint. Yeah. And of course, we employ a lot of these methodologies and tactics. And I'm kind of curious 
as you start to see things in this manner, you start to then see everything in this manner. And this is as I start to work with social psychiatrists and work with them in that setting, I start to see that. Um, and what I find more challenging is those who actually have more power and responsibility and are more threatened by this sensibility. So I'm curious about the tactics that you've employed for those who maintain their power by not using empathic methodologies and, and how you employ that in order to um, follow the ethical example of belief in the worth and dignity of all people as opposed to the maintenance of existing hierarchies. Well, it's a very difficult question. I mean, I, I, the only thing that comes to mind is the kind of workshops I've been running thus far. Um, a lot of people, especially the older people, so I had a, a range of age from like 18 all the way to 45. And some of the older people that came in had a bit of a kind of a, that sort of stance on it. Like they were skeptical to begin with and such. Um, the only time that that worked really well was I'm modeling the kind of things I'm talking about. It's not like I'm there as an expert, like I know. I'll teach you empathy. Like, it, that rarely goes well. So I go in there with me trying to model every interaction, being empathic, being respectful, listening, considering acting, um, just as a way to model that. And that raises it up to at least 50% chance of that person opening up. If I don't do that. Motivated by your success. Yeah, at that least. To the point that you're engaging. Yeah. So that gets their foot in the door, so to speak. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And then I, I model vulnerability, which is I share the failures I've had, the kind of troubles I've had, just so proactively. Um, and then if, if they feel that certain first part was decent enough they feel comfortable, if I do the second part first, they might be like, why are you telling me this? <laughs> but if there's like a level of comfort that's been established, and then they, I share those vulnerable things, and they're actually willing to listen. Now, I was surprised myself. Um, and, then, and then I share experiences like the content of the workshop. And throughout the day, I think the, the openness starts rising. And by the end of the two days, I've seen remarkable changes in people's attitudes, at least in that two-day two day context. Now, the, 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 the question I always ask is, after the two days, what happens? And that's a challenging question for me. Uh, and figuring out, you know, when I leave and, and when, when all this space is gone, does that sustain itself? Are there other things that have to be put in place organizationally or whatever it is that can help sustain this? And that is a challenge that I'm faced with now in trying to figure this out. Hope that's all. Anybody else? Yes. In um, listening to your talk, I, I can see, especially in what I understand about design, I'm not a designer, you know, the, the synergy. I wonder, um, in software development or business and operations, do you find that it's, um, people are as receptive to be empathic, um, especially in software development or even in the bus traditional business, I would say people tend, or at least culturally, it seems like we're, we're built up and taught, especially in formal education, um, to come across as knowledgeable, expert level, so on and so forth. So it al almost seems like being empathic and being the level of vulnerability is sort of um, very foreign to certain disciplines that are outside of design. I wonder if that's your observation as well. Well, I can talk about myself, because I was that engineer. <laughs> um, and I think it's, so here's the thing that's, that's always very interesting to me. So when I was in that engineering mindset, that was my world. That made perfect sense. And everything else did not, quite honestly. But then I had this other experience. And because I stayed there for long enough, this also became valid just as much as this. This doesn't mean, doesn't mean that that's invalid. Just as valid. Just as valid. And then an explicit effort to integrate those two different ways of thinking has something that's been, for me, very, very um, useful. So what I've found in a lot of workshops that I run is uh, I had a, a one workshop in Korea where there is uh, business people, technology people, art students kind of mingled together in running these workshops. And like you said, there are some hesitations and some blocks in the beginning. But once they experience something, uh, the actual quality of the things we're talking about, you'd be surprised at how quickly um, these people who are seemingly unempathic open up. And, and that's, I mean, over, over the uh, few workshops I ran, I come to a place where I don't think anybody's intrinsically non-empathic. I think it's all there. But there are certain hurdles that are preventing that from coming out. 
And if, if you're able to just open something up in that particular person, immediately they are there with you. And by the end of the night, I mean, you can never tell who's an engineer, who's a whatever. Um, but I think getting to that point could be difficult depending on how much baggage you're bringing in. But it's something that I think is, is definitely possible, although it's difficult. Anybody else? Questions? Is that it? Yes. So, how do you practice? How do I practice? Well, how do you the whole thing? I mean, you've correlated this to design, and it seems like you can think um, about this in the context of design. And so, when you're designing, you very actively um, try to practice empathy. Sure. How do you practice in other walks of life where there's no example? And I mean, it seems like the kind of thing that you listen to, you think, oh, this is amazing, or you experience it and you think it's amazing. Just like you have a conversation with your family, and you open up, and you have a moment, but then you go back to dealing with them like you're 16 and they're your parents. <laughs> happens all the time. Sure. How do you get back to that point? Well, I mean, so, so there's a very interesting research by a guy named Antonio Damasio. And he's a, he's a scientist. And he talks about the idea of emotion and feeling as being separate. This is very interesting because it helps me practice what you're talking about. Is the way he talks about emotion versus feeling is emotion is a physical reconfiguration of your body. So when you feel anger, for example, if you observe your whole body, there's a specific configuration in which they're put. Your, your shoulders might be hunched up, your, your eyes might be scrunched. So next time, just try this. Like if you get angry, just like observe yourself. You're like, ah, oh, that's interesting. Like my body is this way. If you forcefully undo that, like you don't feel that all of a sudden. It might go back because it's sort of in that moment, but it's possible to change that. Right? So I've come to a place where I train awareness in that same way. Like in the beginning, it was very much, it's just very reactive. Like somebody says something and I'm like, bullshit or whatever it is, like judgmental. And that went for a long time. And then the second stage to me was I was like able to go meta on myself. So I would blame somebody and judge them. But I see myself blaming, and I hate myself. But I still do it anyways, because it's just still there. And then like, after like, maybe like six or seven months of just like trying these things, I eventually got to a point where I can sense I'm about to judge, which is a very peculiar feeling. I don't know how to explain it, but it starts to slow down bit by bit by bit. And when I'm at least able to do that, I think I start to have a bit of a choice as to any interaction I have with a stranger, with somebody I know, with anybody, to deliberately say, oh, that's interesting. I'm about to judge. What do I want to do? And I may not be always successful at, at blocking that, but it, it, there seems to be some kind of progression that can be practiced through a, a kind of a, a rigorous discipline, so to speak. So I, I try to do that as much as I can. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. So I just want to real quick um, just thank everybody for joining us today for this lecture. Slim, thanks for coming and talking to us. Um, again, if you uh, are interested in this book, it'll be right out back here. Um, and if you also want to check it out online too, he's got your web address. I'm sorry. Realizing it, he talked. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Is that my water?